If you thought that the end of semester here in the U.S. would bring sweet relief from the sights and sounds of pro-Hamas and anti-Semite protests on college campuses in the U.S., well, think again. Pro-Palestinian protests are continuing across the country, a, a topic that we've been closely monitoring at the PDB. Last week, a particularly disturbing demonstration took place in the New York City subway system. A viral video captured the moment that pro-Palestinian protesters boarded a crowded subway car with one demonstrator demanding of commuters, quote, raise your hand if you're a Zionist. This is your chance to get out, end quote. The demonstrator then said, okay, no Zionists, we're good. Mm. Well, look, to be fair, the protesters involved here were a, a mixed bag. Some were, well, some were just morons, too stupid to know what they were protesting about, but certainly enjoying the feeling of community that comes from being in a roving pack of morons. Some were legitimate anti-Semites, and some were paid activists there to rally the others as useful idiots to their cause. According to local reports, three of the protesters were eventually arrested. Ah, only three. Pro-Palestinian demonstrations have been a common sight now in city streets and college campuses since the 7th of October. But the big question, who exactly is funding them? Well, to help us answer that question, we have the national correspondent for The Blaze and the author of Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, The 2020 Riots and the Gaslighting of America. Julio, thank you very much for joining us here on the, on the PDB Situation Report. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. All right, now, let's, I guess, start from 30,000 foot. You've uh, spent a lot of time, probably more time than just about anybody else, analyzing what took place during the 2020 riots. And based on what you've seen and learned from that experience, are there any linkages, are there any commonalities to what's been taking place recently across college campuses in terms of funding, in terms of the, those involved, the people behind the scenes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it is pretty uh, now widely reported, not, not just for me, but that a lot of these uh, same networks that were used to create chaos uh, four years ago, this, this time four years ago, um, they've, they've basically uh, been reactivated to uh, you know, to latch on to a different issue, which is obviously the Israel-Hamas war. And so um, a lot of the same groups that – because of, there's a lot of overlap in terms of how they view uh, with Black Lives Matter and the issue of, of Israel and Hamas, uh, they, they, they view it as one and the same. And that, that's why the, the far left has commonality because they view it in the lens of, of, of racism, of fascism, colonialism, of capitalism, kind of all the – buzzwords that the far left likes to use and so um that's why you often see a lot of the same organizers uh getting people out into the streets um and so that's why uh within our lifetime the palestinian youth movement uh the answer coalition those are kind of the big groups that are that have been organizing these protests uh, since october uh, 8th um and so I think uh, what, what's not really uh, – what, what shouldn't be lost on that is that, yes, obviously there are people who uh, are supportive of the Palestinians and Hamas, um, but the, the, there, is, there, is money, there is money behind it, uh, money that comes from organizations that are tied to Soros, the Rockefeller Fund, um, and even individual big Democratic Party donors have been giving money to, to these groups. And so uh, that's why it's been interesting to see the dynamics play out because obviously – uh, they're protesting not just America in general, but they're, the, the people out in the streets are specifically uh, going after President Biden and the Democratic Party. Yeah, I guess that's that's really the question, I suppose, that a lot of people have, right? I mean, you, you see these protests, and, and I think there's there's some in, in America, perhaps, I suppose, that, that still believe it's just a bunch of kids being kids. It's just, you know, some gormless students, and they, you know, they, they're passionate about this cause. But when you do look at, at what's behind the scenes, what's off the radar screen and, and who's funding and who's organizing, who's paying activists, is there a way for you to, to describe in relatively simple terms what those people, what the organizers' main goal is? What, I mean, what is their objective? It can't just be to cause chaos and, and, and create this, this confusion on the streets and, and, and the clashes with the, with the police. What do you think is their primary objective here? 
Well, that's the thing. That is their primary goal. Um, because, you know, oftentimes when whenever uh, the, the, the Jews for you know, Jew, Jewish voices for peace or within our lifetime or the Palestine youth movement, whenever they block traffic or they block people from getting access to airports, as we've seen, to taking more direct action, there, there was stuff early on with targeting uh, shipping, uh, shipping vessels uh, at, at different ports across the country. Um, people often ask, well, why, why are you, why are you doing this? You're, you're not, you're not bringing over anybody to your side. You're not using the art of persuasion to get people to your side. And the thing is, these are, these are very radical street communists, uh, that I like to call them. And also there's Antifa involved as well. Um, and, and the goal is just to make everyday American lives as miserable as possible, uh, because in order to just get the rest of the country to just given to their demands that's basically it there there, there is no there, there is no attempt to try to like i said just use the art of persuasion they, they just want to kind of grind things to a halt and just kind of slog it out because they view the average american taxpayer as the enemy because the taxes are used used to support israel and go towards you know defense contracts and, and what have you so so they view just regular americans as a propagator of the quote-unquote genocide Okay, but how do you how do you explain the involvement or the the contributions from the the the, the higher level the Democrat uh, sponsors? I mean, the people who normally contribute large amounts of money to political candidates. I mean, what what's what's in it for them if what they're doing is is helping to fund chaos on the streets? Is that really what what their objective is as well? Well, for the individual high level donors, it is a little hard to say. But other than the fact that they just are just supportive of, of these tactics and of this ideology because and, th and that's why we're seeing the kind of fracture within the democratic party um kind of play out uh openly so i can only imagine how it is <laughs> privately um but it, it it you have to understand that again that these people are are ardent believers in the fact that america is so racist and, and it's so, yeah, we, we have to do all these radical things to uh, atone for our you know, quote unquote, uh, past sins in history and all that. And so and then when you throw in genocide today, in their view, well, then, of course, people are going to want to do things uh, in, in their way so that they can say, well, I at least stood up to to, to stop this. So, um, of course, you know, I don't think it's been very helpful um, to, to to disrupt things. And, and, and it's only kind of actually kind of backfired to because to, I've often whenever I post videos, uh, whenever I'm out reporting, I, I do sometimes see comments saying, you know, you know, I'm not as supportive of Israel or this and that, but these people's actions are making me want to support uh, Israel and, and what they're doing to Hamas. So it, 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 it they're, they're doing it, uh, whether or not it's effective. I don't think, I don't think it's going to go so much in their favor, but at the same time, they don't really care they, they, these are, like I said, these are kind of like the anar anarcho communist activists of the Democratic Party that were useful to them during the Trump years because the main target was Trump and, and his base. Um, but now, obviously, it's, it's Biden in charge and, and kind of his people. And so um, they, they, they're more than happy to kind of, you know, have the mentality of burning down the system. And, and well, we just got to start over because that that radical wing of, of the Democratic Party um, doesn't necessarily care who's in charge. They, they just want to be able to control things and, and do things that the, the, the way that they want to. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a really important point. I mean, you're never, you're never really too righteous, you know, right, for the mob, right? You're, at some point, they're going to turn on no matter who it is, right? It could even be the squad members, right, that they, they start getting upset with. But uh, let me ask you this. Um, oftentimes when you, when you see what appears to be a grassroots movement, say it's a, it appears to be a, a, a community uh, activist group that's upset about a, uh, a you know a potential mine that's going to be located in their general you know vicinity uh, or whatever it may be. Uh, oftentimes, if you dig deep enough, you find ties to uh, national level organizations. Right? If it's an environmental issue, it appears to be just this local community group that's trying to you know stop something from happening. But it turns out they're getting funding or legal advice or, or support or strategy advice from whomever, Greenpeace or, or Friends of the Earth or whatever. When you look at what you did and all the work that you did related to the 2020 riots, and now you look at what's happening across the college campuses, is it as specific as seeing, oh, wait, I'm seeing some of these same individuals 
right, involved. I'm seeing some of the same street activists who are being paid and funded for their work. But is, is it that clear or is it not quite that granular yet? I would say that it's dependent on location um, just because uh, so, for example, in New York City, there actually was that famous uh, longtime activist from back in the 60s. She, she made an appearance at Columbia University. I'm, I'm forgetting her name at the moment, but uh, she was helping organize the takeover of Hamilton Hall. And she was telling people how to barricade the doors. And then she was saying, oh, wait, we're being filmed. We got to get the people with cameras away from us. Um, so there are examples of that. But it, it is also kind of hard to, to know for sure, because um, they they are a staunch believers still in, in in wearing masks and you know and whether whether it's like the COVID type masks or the kif or the kafias or just blacked out or you know black block Antifa type garb. So unless they're arrested and then uh, obviously you know their mugshots taken, then we can kind of figure out to see if it's kind of the same repeat offenders. But uh, but also at the same time, I mean yes, because then you look at places like Portland, uh, Oregon, which did also experience a, a takeover of a library. Um, a lot of the people that were there and were arrested, they weren't even students. They they were just people who have been out there causing riots and stuff since you know, even before 2020, but especially uh, four years ago. So um, it, it is I would say it's very much dependent on location. And we only really kind of find out if, if it is the same people unless they're arrested, which, you know, as of late, it hasn't been happening as much just because, it, you know, we are in a post 2020 world, unfortunately, uh, and, and everything that came along with that. So. Um, I, I would say generally, yes, that we, you know, the, there are kind of the same people involved, which is kind of funny because every time they say, oh, they're they're cracking down on students, it's like, well, you know, uh, not an insignificant number of those people are actually just radical street activists that have been doing this for years. Right. I, I think that was one of the smartest moves that they could have made, uh, meaning law enforcement and, and, and thank goodness, at least some of the media started to pick up on it was when they started to, to break down statistics uh, not in, in, you know, they didn't really get too far into the weeds, but they would say, look, you know, 40 percent, 50 percent, 60 percent of those arrested during this particular protest were outside activists and were not students. I think that was important for the for the public to, to understand that, again, it's not this idea of just kids being kids and my goodness, they're following their passion. Um, and I can't believe I just said my goodness. But now when you talk about funding, uh, Julio, is there a way to, to break that down and say, OK, look, I know you mentioned the Rockefeller Fund. I, I, I think that's confusing to people as well. People think of the Rockefellers and they think, really, they're they're contributing money to, to something like this. Talk to me a little bit about about that. What the, the primary groups involved that, that at least that you've seen to date and, you know, what sort of dollars are we talking about? And also, how does that work? Is it just someone gets into a position within these organizations that that supports or sympathizes with some of these chaotic goals and they just start allocating grants and funding? I mean, that is kind of basically how it works. Yeah. I mean, they, they have these program officers that within their organization and, and obviously when uh, you know, these groups have obviously existed for, you know, longer than October 7th. So, I mean, they've been contributing to them for actually many years. Um, and so that's why um, we're actually able to see not only the, the dollar amount, which can be in the hundreds of thousands, over the, but it, it's over the course of, of several years. Um, and so, it, it, and that's significant because, for example, the, the, the protests outside the White House this past weekend, uh, there was around 9,000 people. Well, you know, how, how did... How do they all get there? Well, it's because the Palestinian Youth Movement, the Answer Coalition, they were all advertising all these different buses that people could take from across the country to make sure that they're in Washington, D.C. last Saturday. Um, and I can tell you now, looking ahead, uh, they're going to use that same kind of tactic to mobilize to get people out when Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu comes to address uh, Congress uh, on July 24th uh, 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 next month, right? So. Uh, that that's why it, 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 it goes beyond just actually getting paid to, uh, you know, someone to be there, so, so to speak. But it's also just the logistics behind it. Right. And the signs uh, that they make, I mean, because they're all standardized. Uh, they, they kind of have the all same kind of thing. And sure, they might collect them at the end to reuse them. But uh, they, they they have their 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 iconography type operations and everything like that. So it, it, it it's pretty extensive, and 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 they're able to utilize that to to their benefit. And that's why um, I, I would say you know despite despite everything that's happened, they they've been pretty successful 
in their direct actions, just 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 in generally speaking. Yeah. To what degree? I, I I know this is this is a tough one to to address or at least provide specific details on. But to what de- degree do you believe or suspect that there are? And when I say outside, I mean international groups. And by international, I mean the Iranian regime in particular. Uh, to what degree is 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 that a factor here? And I mean Hezbollah, they operate operations, businesses, companies all over the world. Right. Uh, so the idea that the Iranian regime would look at this and, and think, well, this is and I, I seriously doubt that they looked at it, uh, you know, and, and were surprised. I, I call me cynical, but I think that they've been involved in, in, in a variety of ways. But from your perspective and the work that you do, uh, do you suspect that somewhere in there is the hand of uh, the Iranian regime in one fashion or another, whether it's directly or whether it's disinformation thrown out by proxy groups or, or other elements? No, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and it's just because, I mean, especially with this current administration, I mean, there was an Iranian spy ring within the, the State Department, essentially, right? Um, that, and, and that kind of flew under the radar once, it, you know, from the mainstream media when that, when that came out. So um, I, I would not be surprised at all, um, and, I, and I think you're correct that, that there is definitely foreign money being, uh, being uh, funneled into these groups. I mean, the National uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, I, I believe, kind of has, has some of those uh, foreign ties that, that makes it a little bit more uh, ne- nefarious. So, um, and, and, and they're one of the, again, they're one of the main groups, uh, all, all like all, essentially all the college campus encampments, those were all started by the local Students for Justice in Palestine college group, right? So, I mean, so, I mean, they, and they cause plenty of chaos and, and some even still. Um, they, they, there was the, the case in California State, Los Angeles, where they took over a building just like two days ago. So, I mean, all that is still technically still happening. Yeah, look, I, I really respect the work that you do. I think it's it's critically important, right? I mean, in today's world, people are very busy. They're just trying to put food on the table, take care of the kids, whatever. Um, they see something, they read something, they just, they. a lot of people don't have the time, don't have the ability, whatever it might be, to dig further, right? And to say, well, why is that the case? Who is behind this? Who's funding this? Why are they out there? How do they all have matching tents? Or whatever the simple questions may be, a lot of times they get missed. And certainly we don't seem to have much of a, of a, of a curiosity or an objectivity in, in the, the overall media these days. So I think the work that you're doing is, is very impressive and, and really important to helping people at least understand and get more facts, right? So that it's, it's not just a narrative that people are pushing out, that people swallow whole cloth. Let me ask you this: Are you are you putting together a research for a book on what's been taking place on college campuses? Uh, you know, I've been I've been you know, there's always notes that I take, <laughs> kind of as it kind of as a debrief <laughs> for for these types of situations, um, just because you never know when it might be useful uh, further on down the line. So whether you know whether it's for a book or whether it's for you know some paper at some think tank, I'm, I'm not entirely too sure. But um, you know, really, I don't. I suspect, I suspect, you know, as the election heats up and, you know, depending on the outcome, I think uh, there might be an opportunity to put out uh, something, uh, put out another physical medium about, what ha- about what's happening just because, um, yeah, you, you're right. The, the normal people in this country are focused on other things. And so I'm more than happy to kind of take on the mantle and being like, all right, let me go with the crazies <laughs> um, and, and see, see yeah, how no, it is. Because I think it's, th- I, I, these, I, are, th- these are historical moments. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and, and you pointed out Netanyahu coming to the U.S. to give that speech. Uh, certainly there's the Democratic National Convention coming up. Um, I, I don't think this is going to quiet down. So I'm hoping that you'll, you'll come back and join us again, uh, Julio. This has been really interesting, very fascinating. And, and, and again, very appreciative of the work that you're doing. Julio Rosas, author of Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, The 2020 Riots and the Gaslighting of America and National Correspondent for the Blaze, Again, Julio, thank you very much for joining us here on the Situation Report. Thank you. All right. Well, coming up next, we'll dive into the extensive security measures that are being implemented to protect the 2024 Paris Olympics. Yep, they're coming up soon from potential terror threats. Stay tuned to learn how France is planning to safeguard the Games. I'll be right back. 